Okay, Deuteronomy, we're over the halfway mark now on the way home. We've got to get through a couple, another chapter or two of all kinds of uh, laws and things. And then Moses is going to start getting into some really good, um, good stuff for us to sink our teeth into as New Testament Christians. And um, so I'm looking forward to there, but we just, we're going along, like you said, you know, in this part of Deuteronomy, we're going along, and I just, I consider, I'm getting glimpses into how God thinks. I get glimpses into what he thinks is important. I get glimpses into how he pictures a society that honors him, you know, and it's not, and, and, and I just get it by just, I get these little snapshots of what he thinks important, what, what's he, what he thinks is important and how things should be done, and I understand that he's establishing guidelines. Um, uh, as I read and study, I just find a lot of people think that, you know, a lot of these, they don't know that some of these, some of these laws are kind of tough, but they don't know that anyone ever was brought up on charges and, and stoned for this or that. I mean, it's just sort of like the Lord put it there, but we certainly know of cases, we'll talk about one tonight, where we know it didn't happen that way, and, uh, but the bottom line is we're still we're still looking at this. So we just got this grab bag of topics tonight, primarily falling under laws related to courts and justice and some religious issues and some military issues. Um, and then also family life. And we get into some um, uh, sexual uh, sexual purity issues uh, in, in the, at the end tonight, if we get that far. And so, again, what we have is God setting a baseline for living a pleasing and obedient life before him. That's what I want to do. You know, I want to be able to, I want to feel like I'm walking uh, in, 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 in a way before the Lord that blesses him. So we'll just dive right in. Deuteronomy chapter 20. And we're looking at laws concerning warfare. And we're going to sort of start out looking at sort of spiritual and practical preparation for, for a battle. But what I want to understand is that the first thing he's going to talk about are battles outside the promised land outside the promised land okay and, and we'll i'll make that clear why that has to be the case but these are things like and, and here's the deal i don't think they're going to even do this until king david's time so they still got joshua still got to take him in we got to go through the two or three hundred years of judges and then king david king solomon are really the first ones to take the army back out of the canaan to conquer other lands and we know that king david and solomon expanded israel to its greatest extent that ever was historically and I think that some of these things apply to that. It's not going to be in the near future at all, uh, but it's going to be 400 years in the future. But, you know, God he has no problem thinking ahead, does he? But anyway, let's get rolling. I love verse 1, when you go to war, not if. <laughs> when you go to war. Does that sound familiar to life a little bit? Uh, when you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an armor, army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them. <laughs> you shall not fear I like that. You know, I wish I understood that more of a, as a command than as a general practical idea. You know, just, God just said, thou shalt not fear. Okay, because why? I'm your God. You know, what a good thing for us to remember tonight, right? But you shall not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you. Any different for us? No. Who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Okay, he brought me up out of the spiritual land of Egypt. So I get, you know, again, this all resonates with me. Verse 2. And when you draw near to the battle... The priest shall come forward and speak to the people and shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Uh, do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. I love this verse more. I'd underline it, highlight it, whatever. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight. How? For you against your enemies to give you the victory. And to me, that's just a great encouraging verse. General practical Christian living. You know what? Our God goes with us to fight for us against our enemies for our victory. Amen. You know, what a great God. You know, battles are inevitable. Every one of us is going to have times we feel outgunned and outmaneuvered. Uh, we're going to feel underprepared and overwhelmed, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but we're not to be afraid because these times provide valuable opportunities to see how God wants to come through for us, you know? And sometimes though, but he's not saying, okay, I'm just, you're just going to get up there and then I'm going to go fight your battle. I mean, you're going to go to war. You're, you're going to be in a battle, but you're not, not alone. 
And at the end of the battle, you're going to see how the Lord came through, right? And there's no way to know how great God is until you're in a situation you can't handle, right? How can you know how great your God is until you're in a situation you can't handle? And you have to just give it to him. Until you don't know what to do, until it seems impossible to solve this problem, it's then that you find out how great your God is. True? True. Absolutely, right? Paul said in Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can be against us? You plus God make an unbeatable team. I don't care how many you're against. You plus God are in the majority, right? Um, moving on, though, a second point, a second point. In other words, don't be fearful, but now some exemptions from military duty. They're quite interesting. Look at verse 5. Then the officer shall speak to the people, saying, Is there any man who has, number one, built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man dedicate it. Uh, and then number six, verse six, excuse me. And is there any man who has, number two, planted a vineyard and has not enjoyed its fruit? How would you like to get that deferment? <laughs> planted a vineyard, can't go to war. Sorry, got to go enjoy the wine I'm going to make for my vineyard. Okay, go. Come on back when you've had, when you've done it. Yeah, right. Okay. But he says, go, look at that. Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man enjoy its fruit. Verse 7, and is there any man who has number three betrothed a wife and has not taken her? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in battle and another man take her. Okay, so I think it's cool. God's God, God saying, listen, I want you to go to war, but here's the deal. The priority I have for you is enjoying the blessings of me in areas of like housing, crops, and marriage. God says, listen, we're going to fight a battle. I'm with you, but you know what? I don't want to see people missing out on that. Now, isn't that a, a neat little insight into God's heart? That he's worried about that stuff? How cool is that? Verse 8. And the officer shall speak further to the people and say, and this is a fourth deferment, is there any man who is fearful and faint-hearted? <laughs> Before battle, wouldn't you say just about everybody? <laughs> well, the difference between being fearful but faint-hearted means you're useless, right? But is there any man who's fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go back to his house, lest he make the heart of his fellows melt like his own. And when the officers have finished speaking to the people, then commanders shall be appointed at the head of the people. So God was perfectly willing to use those who were left at left after the officers excused people from these four exemptions. You know, uh, these exemptions, remarkable among an army, right, were a powerful testimony that Israel trusted in God for military victory, not in just mere numerical superiority. You know what? And to God, the size of the army clearly wasn't important. Ah! You scaredy cat, yeah, go back on home. You, know, you can make bandages and send them to the front. You know, there's probably something you can do back there. You'll do more good, right? Uh, but God's less concerned about the size of the army, much more concerned about the size of the heart of the army. You know, what's, what's their heart like? He didn't want people who might be distracted from battle by worry and cares of everyday life. He didn't want people who were fearful and not really trust. If they were fearful and faint-hearted, are they, are they fully trusting the Lord? Um, uh, here's the deal fearful people often very often are cynical and critical but it's a facade for their fear you know, they're pointing out all the problems like there's some genius but the bottom line is they're afraid it's like rice yeah. electronic demons in the house tonight <laughs> I think I've turned them off nice try Satan not stopping us. Anyway, God can do far more with a smaller army that's really committed to him than a bigger army that's full of compromise. Think about that. How much more he can do with a committed group of people. And boy, does that just speak to the church? How much can God do with a bunch of committed Christians versus a mass of half-hearted, lukewarm? And what did Jesus say about lukewarm faith? Spit you out of my mouth. Give me, give me someone. I just want to know, are you... Are you cold or are you hot? I want to work with the hot ones, okay? Oh, yeah. The cold ones, the scaredy ones, the ones that have got distractions and all, you go to the side. I want a committed army, and there's nothing that can stop us, right? It reminds you, it probably reminds some of you, too, the story of Gideon in Judges chapter 7. Gideon has this army, 32,000 men, and, God, and he's getting ready to go fight an army of 130,000, right? And God says, nah, yeah, too many guys, okay? I want you to send back everybody that's afraid. And so he loses, goes from 32,000 and 22,000 left. 
he, he didn't pick an army very well, <laughs> but he's left with 10,000. He says, okay, ready, go. No, no, too many, too many. And then he does this thing about have everyone go down to the water and drink. And the ones that lick the water like a dog or a cat, send those home, but the ones that cup it, keep them. Or it's the other way around. I never can remember that story. But he does one or the other. Most of them do it the way they're not supposed to. Well, he goes from 32,000 to 300. And he's going like, really? Really, God? No, you're plenty. Trust me. And so God gives them this strategy and this plan, and they go. And with God with them, he goes against a Midianite army of 135,000, and God gives them a victory. So it's like, if God's on your side, it doesn't matter who you're up against, Absolutely. right? Okay? Sure. But, if, but if you're not really going into battle with God, if, you, if you're with a bunch of people that are saying they are, but they really aren't, you're not going to have victory like a handful of sold-out, committed Christians will in fighting for the Lord today, you know? So, we come now to rules of engagement for cities outside of Canaan. Um, always offer peace first. Look at verse 10. When you draw near to a city to fight against it, offer terms of peace to it. And if it responds to you peaceably and it opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. But if it makes no peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God gives it into your hand, you shall put all its males to the sword. Okay? So look the priest. So this has to be outside of Canaan, doesn't it? Because he's not, they ain't got no marching orders to go into the promised land and offer peace. No, it's like they're in a war of extermination. They are. There's no other word for it, right? So this has to be talking about outside of the promised land. So this is going to be something I think, you know, I think it's going to be quite far future, right? Now, it was simply understood in the ancient world that any surviving male would be a perpetual enemy of the people who had been conquered, of the people who had conquered his city, and prisoners of war were far more often um, simply killed rather than taken into imprisonment. It was just a different world 3000 BC, okay? I mean, we're, we're, we're in this world right now. This is, they're writing about, you know, 2000, 1500 BC. It was brutal. Warfare was, you did not want to lose. There was high motivation to win. Okay, <laughs> you didn't want to be on the losing side, right? And anyway, for God to ordain this, it must also speak to God's just judgment and wrath on pagan peoples. You know, he's willing to let them accept peace. He is offering that to them. But if they refuse, um, uh, he'll, he'll retract that offer of mercy, and it's pretty brutal. Verse 14 says, But the women and the little ones, the livestock and everything else in the city, all its spoil you shall take as plunder for yourselves, and you shall enjoy the spoil of your enemies, which the Lord God has given you. Thus you shall do to all the cities that are very far from you, which are not cities of the nations here. Okay. Um, now, rules of engagement are very different in the promised land. Look at verse 16. But in the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes, but you shall devote them to complete destruction. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Pisia, the Parasites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, uh, as the Lord your God has commanded, that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practices that they have done for their gods, so that you sin against the Lord your God. There's just a sense of these people and their possessions as, as, as actually being a sacrifice of devotion unto God, like a burnt offering, because he says they're devoted to destruction. And now that's a, that's a spirit, that's a religious practice term in Hebrew, this de idea of devotion. The sacrifices you brought to the tabernacle were a devotion unto the Lord. And, and the Lord's sort of using this kind of holy language for what is going on here, okay? And this is a sacrifice of pure wickedness, okay, unto destruction. You know, Genesis 15 suggests that these people had 400 years to repent while Israel had gone to Egypt, okay? And God says, hey, while you're gone, uh, for four generations, and, and this is interpreted as 100-year generations, because people live longer then, right? Um, for four generations, uh, we're going to see if the Amorites repent, okay? But by the time, so they've come back, no repentance, okay? No repentance. So um, God, um, you know, and we don't know, not everything. We don't have anything else in Scripture. We, we don't know that God wasn't trying to do, you know, God sent Jonah, you know, to the, what, the Nineveh, uh, Ninevites, yeah. Nineveh. I mean, there's there no more wicked bunch of people. So who, who's to say God wasn't doing things, sending prophets, going, dude, you got no more of this burning your babies. That's not cool. You know, I can't believe, you know, I think there's reason, in my heart, I, I think my God would do that, you know, but I'm not trying to make doctrine out of it, but I just believe he's, God is just, okay? 
Um, the Israelite army is merely a sword in God's hand, right, to meet out wrath and judgment. Um, he often used foreign armies to do this, but here he's going to use his own. Um, and we talked about, yeah, okay, anyway, verse 19. When you besiege a city for a long time, making war against it in order to take it, you shall not destroy. This is, war, okay, talk about out of nowhere, okay? Uh, you shall not destroy its trees, okay, by wielding an axe against them. I was wondering about the trees, weren't you? I was really wondering. <laughs> Lord, have you thought about the trees when they're at war? Huh? I mean, just, I, I love how God's mind thinks. Oh, did I mention the tree part yet? Okay, yeah, when you're, don't, I love that. Okay, here, look at this. You may eat from them, but you shall not cut them down. Are the trees in the field human, that they should be besieged by you? Only the trees that you know are not trees for food you may destroy and cut down, that you may build siege works against the city that makes war with you until it falls. Practical long-term advice for after the war. It's going to be nice after war to have fruit-bearing trees left instead of them instead of them getting turned into spears and arrows. You know, um, the uh, the war will end. And listen, you know, they could chop up olive trees and grapevines and banana trees. Banana, no, no, no. Actually, actually, there's banana trees in Israel. We're going to see them. I just don't think they were there in Bible times. But man, we saw banana groves when we were there in November. But anyway, the bottom line is, listen, save that stuff. I think there's an interesting analogy here too when churches. Uh, lash out at other denominations as we're battling against Satan. But in a way, you know, don't people get saved in just about every church? Aren't there people that go to a church we would never <coughs> commit to being our home church, but we know people find Jesus, you know? And we don't know where they're going to end up, but that's where they, but you know what? It's sort of like we, we shouldn't be chopping down trees that bear fruit, even though maybe it's not a fruit I like to eat, you know? But you know what I do love is people that find Jesus. And then we pray that they'll be brought to a place where they can get the fullest understanding of a life in Christ. But I find an interesting analogy there in that sort of an idea. Um, we shouldn't be swinging our acts of truth indiscriminately. That um, have just tr trust, you know. We, we, we're where we want to be. Let's just trust Jesus. Jesus can save someone anyway, right? That's right. Praise God. Okay, Deuteronomy 21. Okay, atonement for unsolved murders. We're uh, sort of out of the war mode now and back into civil life. Verse, 20, uh, verse, verse 1 in, of 21. If in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess, someone is found slain, lying in open country, and it is not known who killed him, then your elders and your judges shall come out, and they shall measure the distance to the surrounding cities. Okay? So I think we have here death from natural causes. Um, or excuse me, death from natural causes has been ruled out. And it's evidently a homicide. There's evidence for that. Probably a spear sticking out of them. Might go. He probably didn't fall on his spear. I'm guessing somebody killed him. Okay, right. Or an arrow through his head. It's hard to do. Okay. And so <laughs> I'm tired, folks. Okay. So I may get silly tonight. But uh, the killer's unknown. That's the bottom line, right? It was important. Uh, this, uh, this was important based on a principle stated in Numbers 35 where God said that the blood of unsolved and unavenged murders defiled and pollutes the land where I walk. So he's always saying, just don't walk around, ah, somebody murdered that guy, whatever. No, so he's sort of saying, I, I want you to try to find out. I want you to make the effort. And then we're going to find out. And if you can't, listen, they don't have CSI, okay? I mean, it's sort of like, no witnesses. What are you going to do? You know, I don't know. Um, some very unique sandal track that only one guy makes a sandal and I don't know what they do but um, you've got to try you've got to try um, but here's the deal if a murderer cannot be avenged some sort of cleansing is necessary to cleanse that spilled blood something has to be done uh, to appease the Lord about, over this murder of, of someone that's made in his image right um, and so here's what happens verse 3 and the elders of the city that is nearest to the slain man so they've sent a few guys out there. Now they're going, okay, what town is closest here? Okay, Bethlehem, whatever. We need to bring the elders of Bethlehem. Basically, God's establishing who has jurisdiction in a murder like this. And so they'll bring people from the nearest village right there, okay? And, and this, these people shall come and it says they shall take a heifer that has never been worked and that has not pulled a yoke. A uh, heifer is a young juvenile cow, often female. doesn't have to be, I don't believe. But it's certainly a young cow that has never been mated or anything like that. Maybe one that's being held aside, perhaps for sacrificial purposes, because it's like unblemished. 
or something like that. But anyways, but it's never been worked. No one's ever uh, done any work with it, right? Verse 4, And the elders of that city shall bring the heifer down to a valley with running water, uh, which is neither plowed nor sown, so sort of wild land, and, and, and shall break the heifer's neck there in the valley. So it seems to me this may or may not be the site of the murder, but they know their area, and the idea is they're now responsible for making the sacrifice. I guess it's been determined. We can't figure out who did this. Bring in these elders. We're going to make do the sacrifice for this murder. And it just says it since it's a valley that has to have running water. Well, if the guy didn't get killed in a valley with running water, then they're going to have to do this somewhere else than where he got killed. I maybe I think through this too much. Anyway, um, but definitely this heifer is not sacrificed in any normal way. It's very rare that an animal had its neck broken as a mean. But God in this scenario wanted the neck broken. Okay, verse five. Then the priests. The sons of Levi shall come forward, for the Lord your God has chosen them to minister to him and to bless in the name of the Lord. And by their word, every dispute and every assault shall be settled. All the elders of that city nearest to the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer. So they've got water, running water, right? They're going to wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley. And they shall testify this. Our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our eyes see it shed. Accept atonement, O Lord for your people Israel whom you have redeemed and do not set the guilt of innocent blood in the midst of your people Israel so that their blood guilt be atoned for you. So you shall purge the guilt of innocent blood from your midst when you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Okay, so they, they, set, they, they break the neck, right? And then they wash their hands. Does that remind us of anything, washing? Their hands of a murder. Uh, yes. Pontius Pilot washed his hands. Mm -hmm. Okay, sort of same interesting, sort of same idea, except he was lying. <laughs> he, he couldn't yeah. literally wash his hands, but the Lord sort of doing something like that. And what the people are saying, Lord, we don't believe anyone in our village or in this area committed this murder, and we are sort of doing a cleansing and hope, wanting you to see that as us being washed in your eyes. Of any guilt for this okay it's a sort of a cool thing you know um, we've done all we could to settle it but uh, we are clean from from guilt in the matter of this slain man Lord okay and um, now if they hadn't done everything they could to try to find the murder this would be an empty gesture God gonna accept it you didn't do you didn't do anything to find out who did it what are you talking about? What are you washing your hands already for? <laughs> Put the water back in that jar. Dry your hands off. You're not done. You need to do a little more looking around. No, but anyway, uh, it just it did remind me of Pilate washing his hand. That was sort of a futile gesture uh, again. But anyway, now, interesting. Uh, verse 10, something about marrying female captives. Sort of getting back to a, a war footing. Verse 10, when you go out to war against your enemies and the Lord your God gives them into your hand and you take them captive and you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and you desire to take her to be your wife, and you bring her home to your house. Just going to pause there. In the ancient world, it wasn't uncommon for a man, especially a young single guy, has gone off to war, uh, to seek a wife, perhaps, in the out, out there. Okay, but he could also also be married already. But anyway, it wasn't unusual to take a wife from among the peoples being concert, conquered, especially you know if he was a beautiful woman. Yet obviously, this was open to great abuse. So God gives some specific guidelines to govern this practice among his people. Um, I think this had to be a situation arising far outside of Canaan again, since this couldn't possibly be allowed inside Canaan, could it? You ain't bringing no Amorite home. Yeah. You ain't bringing no Hittite home, no Jebusite home. Uh, not during. So this is probably, you know, I think something that happens after, you know, maybe King David, King Solomon times going out to battle. The bottom line is it, it just never came into play until then. Um, it may have never actually really happened, but God made provision for it to protect women in such primitive times. So here's the deal. Guy has this gal, verse 12. She, so he's bringing her home. She shall shave her head and pair, and that means trim or cut her nails. We don't know some of these things. They thought maybe these tribes have long. Have you seen some of these people, women have incredibly long, curly, funky looking nails? I don't know, you know? Well, you're cutting that stuff off, okay? And uh, anyway, and it says, She shall take off the clothes in which she was captured and shall remain in your house and lament at her father and her mother a full month. Okay, so sort of began a process of breaking her with her past and, uh, and, and trying to grow a willingness to start anew. Certainly shaving her head is a humbling thing, going, Okay, this is a completely new deal now. 
okay? You know, I don't know, maybe you can grow, eventually grow back, but this is sort of new beginning, okay? And uh, cutting the hair and the, and the nails, right? Um, I think presumably she had to be willing to convert to the worship of Jehovah. So she had to go through the process of a, of a proselyte, right? The rites of Judaism. Um, and to be a time where she has to resolve issues in her heart regarding her family. Perhaps some of them were killed. Um, and, and also her husband gets to sort of, he, he's going to live with her without any contact, okay, for a month. And, and this could possibly allow a cooling off period where he goes, what on earth was I thinking? You know, I don't know. Well, keep in mind she is bald, okay. Um, but uh, <laughs> give her a chance, you know what I'm saying? But I don't know. But there is a chance he could go, bad idea, okay. But anyway, so after a month, after that, you may go, go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. But if you no longer delight in her, you shall let her go where she wants. Now, how interesting. She can either remarry, or I would read that to say she could return to her family if he decides he doesn't want her to be his wife for whatever reason, right? But you shall not sell her for money, nor shall you treat her as a slave, since you have humiliated her. Uh, and there's no question that, that you, you're captured, you're brought in as, a, as someone that's been captured in war. And then you go through the shaving and the nail trimming thing. Yeah, that would be humiliation, okay? But I think that's a remarkable example of just unheard of protection for the rights of a foreign woman. Isn't that neat? I mean, I mean, God's watching after him, right? Anyway, the 15, uh, the, the inheritance rights of the firstborn, which opens up a can of worms. Okay, verse 15. If a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him children. And if the firstborn son belongs to the unloved, then on the day when he assigns his possessions as an inheritance to his sons, he may not treat the son of the loved as firstborn in preference to the son of the unloved wife, who, whose son is in fact the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the first fruits of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. Okay? I'll just say, probably in this day, first marriage was almost always an arranged marriage in these cultures back then. It wasn't until Jesus. It, it still is today in some Christian cultures. I went to India. I, I've told the story a million times, but I went to India to work with a Calvary Chapel of India. And I meet the pastor. And he's saying, hey, today before we go out to a church for you to preach, we're going to, my son, and his son was driving us. We're going to go to, I forget his name, Habib's house. And uh, his wife, they just had a baby. And we want to, we want to go, he wants to go by and see the baby. And uh, you get to meet the baby and his wife and all that. And so um, I'm in the front seat with Habib and we're driving along. I said, so Habib, tell me how you and your wife met. And he said, at our wedding. What? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, the first time you talked to her or whatever. At her wedding. No, okay, no, no. The first time you saw her at, at her wedding, this was 2010, okay? And all of his sons, it was the same way. He arranged the first wedding. And so, um, all I'd say, imagine that, that when you see this idea of the unloved wife, it's not un unimaginable that that sort of happens, especially if a second one comes in the picture which and so now here's the deal after your parents have arranged the first one I, I i think you're kind of free to do whatever you want but we've got now this problem of polygamy don't we okay so that's the, that's the big hairy gorilla in the room right now okay but i'm just trying to say how this happened how that would happen i think i think that's how this happens okay now i just want to say this virtually every single time polygamy is in view in the old testament it's not a picture picture for those involved and it creates problems like this right but yet, God never forbade it. There's nowhere in the Bible that says no. But, but, but there's an asterisk, okay? Anyway, however, in Genesis 2, clearly God pictured one man or one woman, didn't he? Okay, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And so why did God allow polygamy in the Old Testament? The Bible doesn't specifically say why. We can only speculate about God's silence, but there's some factors to consider. Warfare in ancient times was especially brutal. Uh, with an incredibly high rate of fatality from injury because of infection. They had no clue how to deal with wounds, really, by and large. Uh, this would have resulted in a greater percentage of women than men. Third, due to patriarchal society, it was impossible for an unmarried woman to provide for herself. There's just no way. Now, if there's not enough husbands to go around, what are you going to do? You know, some, 
So did God permit this as a way in, in difficult times for a woman to be taken care of? Women were often uneducated, untrained. They relied on their fathers, brothers, and husbands for provision and protection. Um, unmarried women were often subjected to prostitution and slavery, not out in Israel, but in these lands and these places, right? Thus with women, probably outnumbering men, it would have left many women in a very untenable circumstance. So it seems God may have allowed polygamy to protect and provide for women who could not find a husband otherwise. A man could take multiple wives and serve as the provider and protect, protector of them all, okay? Not ideal, uh, but living, the truth would be, if this was you in 1500 BC, in the rocky, there ain't, there's no Publix, there's nothing, there's just this rock hut, okay? That's gonna look pretty good to be out by yourself underneath a lamb skin or something, and you've got no, I mean, you're gonna do what you have to do to live, aren't you? I think so I, I, I try to be understanding right not ideal but better than the alternatives right the whole vibe changes in the New Testament but it seems to be not so much God's disallowing something he previous allowed as it is God's restoring marriage to his original plan okay I've understand all of that I understand these things but I really want us now in this new covenant to move towards back to Genesis 2 this has always been my original plan History's moved on from these days, right? Um, in 1 Timothy 3, elders had to be the husband of one wife. Okay, It's thought that was to weed out um, husbands that were husbands of two wives. Okay, um, But here's the deal. Elders, uh, the, the, the criteria, now there's a whole bunch of criteria for elders, weren't they? Do you realize that every Christian was supposed to be all of them? This wasn't like, I hope there's a few guys out there that are extra special and we're gonna make these 13 little rules that only a couple of guys could no these were things that hey this is the bar this is the bar to be a leader and that's to fully embrace all of these Christian characteristics and an elder had to have all of them had to be able to do all of them okay and so the idea was all Christians were supposed to be that and so what we have is more than just the elders couldn't be polygamous it's saying that really a Christ following Christian shouldn't have multiple wives either so there's just this pressure there's this pressure and I tell you throughout the new testament there's just there just had to be pressure and i think um by the time the jews came back uh from babylon i'm not sure i'd do a little more checking but i don't think polygamy was really in play anymore and i really think the jews had, had sort of forced it out of jewish society by the time jesus came along i can't think of a single polygamous scenario in the new testament uh, in the gospels the Gospels of Jesus going around and talking to a guy's second wife or something. I, I, I can't think of any of that. So I think in Israel, it, God had accomplished what he wanted to accomplish, right? Anyway, every passage teaching on marriage in the New Testament pictures a husband and a wife, single, singular, tense, never plural. Um, And certainly today, in most cultures, women are able to provide for and protect themselves, uh, removing the only positive aspect of polygamy. You know? So, um, you ever watched any of those polygamy shows, reality TV shows? Oh, yeah. Just ridiculous. I've been watching the ones where the women are escaping, yeah. you know, and, they, and there's got they've got this like underground railroad. To help these women and then they start saying what it's really like and you realize the women that are still back in there in it they're completely deceived they have they're just in total denial because the ones that come out and go it's horrible it's horrible to have seven other wives you know um, do you guys know why I'll just, I'm probably, why why Mormons believe in polygamy no. why really in their hearts they still do no. they abide by the law but in their hearts and when they can get away with it they still do it. And here's the deal, why? Because you understand that in, in, in the Mormon faith, every man and wife are on their way to becoming gods. Mother and father God, and they're gonna get their own planet to populate. I just, I, two summers ago, I read this incredible, incredible treatise on the history of Mormonism. And these are, these are what um, uh, Brigham Young, these are the writings of Bri Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, and the other guys, you know, so this is what they wrote. This is why you need, so why they told their guys, you need to have many wives and many children because 
your, your, your mother and father God. You're going to be producing still more children. That's why they believe Jesus was the child of father and mother God. That's what Mormons believe about Jesus. And Satan is his brother. He a, has, a, has a brother. Satan is his name. Okay. So anyway, uh, and so you, your planet that you're going to get is going to be populated by all of your children that you have. Okay. And all of their children and all of their children. Now you can start out with two kids or when you die, you can have 70 kids having kids, having kids, having kids, having kids. And all of those are, those souls are gonna populate your planet when you go to, if you, if you accomplish, you have to go, now listen, it's a stringent thing to go through all the levels of Mormonism, all the way to the main temple in Salt Lake City and be declared so a, a, a man and a wife that have met every doctrine of Mormonism, but that's what underlies polygamy today. These guys are crying, trying to create genealogies of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren ad infinitum, and all of them are going to populate their planet one day. So just so you know, I never had heard that until I read this and saw these original founding fathers write about it in very plain text in their books. You'll never find that out when we're at the front door, okay? Now, they love to talk to you about Jesus, 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 love, 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 okay? But there's so much you don't find out about. Okay, anyway, let's move on. <clears throat> okay. All of that, okay, all that birthed out of the loved and unloved son, right? Uh -huh. What God's saying, I don't care if you loved her or not. If that was your firstborn son, he gets everything. Again, is God just or what? God is just, right? Okay, a rebellious son. I'm sure none of us can relate to that in here. Verse 18. <laughs> If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, uh, though they discipline him, he will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives, and they shall say to the elders of the city, Our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And then look at this. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. <laughs> So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. I wonder how much trouble we'd have with juvenile delinquency today if we'd clung to that little rule, you know? Probably be a real different picture, but no. Yeah. What an extreme case of punishing someone uh, for breaking the, the fifth commandment to honor your father and mother. Now, here's what we believe, not children. This would be like an adult child still at home, still dependent on mom and dad, just drinking, getting being drunk, and, and a rebellious, someone of of an age of accountability, okay? So it's not gonna be a kid with ADD or something, which, but I don't think anyone had ADD back then. But you know what I'm saying, this is not for kids, this is for adult men, right? Now it might be late 19, 20 year olds or something like that, but anyway. Um, but to someone in determined rebellion against his family. Um, and here's the deal, he's gonna be put on trial before the elders of the city. And if they determined him to be chronically rebellious, then he was to be stoned. But I think it's important to note that the parents could not by themselves kill their son by this law. You know what it said? You've got to take it to the elders. Now, what are the elders going to do? They're a bunch of very wise, biblically literate guys. What are they going to do? First thing they're going to do is try to figure this thing out. Okay, what's he doing? Talk to the kid. What are you thinking? What are you going to do? The law says you have to be stoned if you keep doing this. Can we have a little conversation here? Okay, can we talk about a little bit of behavioral modification on your part? You know what? They didn't want us. Who wants to stone someone's son? Nobody, nobody wants to do that, right? And so we have to understand that would not be the first step. And, and the whole thing about witnesses and all of that, you know, um, arguably both parents could be two witnesses, but I just believe that they're, they're, the son is being brought before an impartial group of judges, and I think they're going to want to try to work things out, right? Um, now, it's, this is, was in contrast to the surrounding ancient cultures where we find that fathers had absolute right of life or death over their children their whole life. Father could just whack his son anytime. If he got mad at him, and there was no law, no law, really no law against it, okay? So that, as much as anything, this is a control of parental authority, okay? And there's no known case of this being carried out, even in the writing of Jewish tradition. It's a warning, okay? But I think too, well, think about this, you know, I think of the story of the prodigal son. How glad I am that father didn't do this to his son. That was a Jewish father, right? What, rebellious son? Okay, here's your money, son. That's grace, that's mercy. That's really our model, isn't it? And look at how the story ends. It's amazing. 
And like I say, your prodigals are just working on their testimony. Don't give up on them, okay? Jesus is going to bring them back home one day, all right? Okay, interesting one. A man hanged on a tree is cursed. Hmm, verse 22. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, you hang him on a tree. So that's what you're supposed to do, okay? And his body, though, shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. Your Bible say, may, may say accursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Now, in the thinking of ancient Israel, there was something worse than being put to death. It was then having your corpse left exposed to shame to the community even after you were dead. You might say, I'm dead, who cares? But to them, it was a horrific thing to imagine. I'm going to be laying, you know, hung up there naked, dead. And who knows, bugs on me and birds poking, pecking my eyes out. But the rule is you couldn't, st you couldn't leave them up overnight. Okay, now number two, this is not talking about hanging. Okay, it's not talking about that. The Jews didn't do that, okay? <laughs> I just went out on the internet, okay? Um... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? All I'm trying to say is uh, they didn't believe in What did they do? They stoned. That's how they did it. So what they're saying is when the person had died, this hanging on the tree was something that was prescribed as the final bit of the punishment, but not beyond sunset. And the body had to be taken down. And so the idea was not to leave it up for days and eight days. That's what the other cultures did. We know that they would leave bodies up for weeks. I mean, they'd leave them up until they just decomposed and fell apart. And there's a few pieces of the skeleton hanging there because it was gross and it stunk and everything else, right? ISIS does that today, do they not? Mm -hmm. Same thing. How tragic, man. They're just right back to 1500 BC. Isn't that crazy? But all I'm saying is, uh, this wasn't, the Jews didn't hang people by a rope. They, they stoned them and this was something to be done. Um, this was a crucifixion. But they wouldn't have been, they, they, the Jews didn't crucify either. Only the, Rome, the Romans brought that into the, into the land, okay? Uh, they actually banned the Jews from stoning. The, when the Romans came in, the Jews were no longer allowed to exercise capital punishment. Well, at least in the city where the soldiers were and stuff. I don't know that stoning still did. You know, they brought the woman caught in adultery. They, they wanted to stone her, right? So we believe it. You know, well, Peter, Paul got, uh, Paul Steve, got stoned. Steve. You know, Steve so yeah, Stephen got stoned. So there was still, it's weird. You, you see both. The Romans, that's why they took Jesus to the Romans. They couldn't do it themselves. So, they, so the Romans had to, had to execute him. Because, but it was, I guess it was federal charges. I don't want to go down that rabbit trail. The idea is they weren't hanging by a rope. I'll just leave it with that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting. Paul talks about this in do, uh, this verse here in, in verse 23 in Galatians 3. In, in verse 13, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. And he puts in parens, for it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And so he's drawing an analogy to Christ hanging on that cross in that idea of death and shame, right? But taken down before sunset. But he's just comparing where uh, Moses spoke of the curse uh, uh, and the shame of, of this was is, is comparable to what we have on the cross. Same ideas, okay? Uh, curses everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So through Christ's willingness to be cursed and humiliated in that way, even in death, allowed us to receive the promise of the Spirit. How beautiful. So die, Jesus not only died in our place, in our place, he also took the place as the accursed of God, being hung on a tree in open shame and degradation. And he received this curse and humiliation which we deserve, not him. Okay? So we're redeemed, though, by that curse uh, that Jesus endured. And we no longer have to fear that God wants to curse us, right? He wants to bless us now. But not because of who we are, but who we are in Christ. Deuteronomy 22. I think we're going to make it. I like this, various laws that demonstrate kindness and sexual purity, okay? Verse 1. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray and ignore them. You shall take them back to your brother. If he does not live near you and you do not know where he is, you shall bring it to your home. And it shall stay with you until your brother seeks it. Then you shall restore it to him and you shall do the same with his donkey or with his garment or with any lost thing of your brother's. Uh, now this could be, when we see brother here, this can be biological brother or fellow Israelite neighbor. It's a pretty broad term. Okay. You know, it's not like you're allowed to keep 
some awesome code that clearly does not have your bro older brother's name in it, okay? No, you can't keep, <laughs> you're, supposed to, you're supposed to return everything you can to anybody, right? Um, the verse three, you should do the same with his donkey, with his garment, with lost thing of your brothers, which he loses and you find you may not ignore it. You shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fallen down, okay, uh, by the way and ignore them. You shall help him to lift them up again. God here condemned the sin of doing nothing when something needs to be done, right? That's all. To see your brother in need and to do nothing is to do evil in God's eyes. You know, this is loving others as you love yourself. Same when something's lost. A finder cannot claim it as theirs without taking all due diligence to restore it. And God's saying it's not finders, keepers, losers, weepers. You know, it's like you find it, you need to try to give it back. You need to, if, if at all possible. You know what I wrote down here? Just reminds me of good old America I grew up in. And you know what? Sometimes here, I, I still get blessed. I left my house one day with my cell phone on my wallet on the roof. Okay, drove down the street. I came all the way to the church. I'm going... <gasps> it was gone and I had no idea I said, oh, oh, so I'm calling the bank I get home and there's my wallet and my phone right inside the door, my front door my neighbor had walked down the street to the intersection where when I turned it slid off into a four way intersection and he picked it up before anybody and he, and he looked at it, oh it's John took it to my house, put it there I mean, but America used to just be like that and that, that's just what we did I mean, if you found money, you would just go. At 20, you'd go and back into the store and go, you know, I found this in front of your store. Maybe someone's going to come looking. I mean, that's just what we, that's how it used to be. It used to be wonderful. You know, and it's still wonderful when that happens. I don't think it's so much the case, certainly not in big cities maybe, but um, God's just saying, I want it to be like that, you know? Uh, try to help people. Just be nice to people, okay? Okay, verse 5 is very interesting, okay? A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Oh, this is serious stuff to God, cross-dressing, drag queens. Um, but that's what's in view. Uh, to God, this is an abomination. Now, some Christians, interesting today, took this verse as some proof text against women ever wearing pants. Isn't that interesting? I mean, how legalists love to to take something like that. So, you know, women women can never wear pants. Some Christian groups command that women wear only dresses. Yet this is not a command against women wearing a garment that may resemble something men wear. I think of the Scottish wear kilts. It's okay. They're not trying to look like women, okay? It's a unique male thing. This is a command against dressing in a manner whose purpose is to deliberately blur the line between sexes. Or, I would even say to confuse about the sexuality of the person, okay? I read a quote about this verse written 20 years ago by a pastor, here it is. The dramatic rise in cross-dressing, transvestitism, androgynous behavior and gender bender behavior in our culture is a shocking trampling of this command and will reap a bitter harvest in more perversion and more gender confusion in our culture in the future. Wow was he spot on. Could he imagine 2017? I bet he couldn't. <laughs> not what we see now. Uh -uh. Not, what, not what we're told is the law and is normal. Oh my my, has that bird come home to roost? You know, and it's true, man. It's a slippery slope. It's just a slippery slope. And, and mankind, apart from the Lord, has no desire in ending, ending the slip, right? Okay, not for something completely different. This is another one like don't chop down trees when you're at war, you know? <laughs> Okay, if you come across a bird's nest in any tree or on the ground with young ones or eggs, and the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall let the mother go, but the young you may take for yourself, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long. God cares about ecology. He cares about his creation. You know, I think this goes along with a bit. It probably should have gone back there with a bit about chopping down trees and more. Me. But what an interesting thing. God was concerned enough he wanted that written down, right? Um... So here he cares about animal life and the preservation of species. And it says that it may go well with you that you may live long. Really? How we treat birds? All I'd say is, first, um, I would say it's, it's good for us to be obedient to the smallest of God's commands because it will bring a blessing. Doing something as simple as this is a blessing to God. Cool, right? 
Uh, secondly, because kindness and gentleness in small things often, not always, but often speaks to our ability to be kind and gentle and weightier things. Isn't that true? Isn't what you do with something small going to be reflective of maybe a more serious, a more higher degree of responsibility? If someone's cruel to animals, not only is that sin, but they're also much more likely, I think, to be cruel to people. And if Israel allowed such cruelty to flourish, it would harm the nation. You know, I don't know. I just know that one of the most common crime profiles of serial killers, when they go back and look at all of them, is that they began by killing animals. Yeah. Just in grotesque, burning them to death, hanging them and slicing them open and watch. They, they, they began with that sadistic desire to kill animals, and it turned into the serial murder of people. You know, it morphed into that. And I think how interesting, maybe God is even getting at something like that. Because what you do in that simple thing it can magnify over a lifetime into something else. And it's the same. I mean, I've seen people. You know, you know, people are some people are cruel to animals, aren't they? Don't kill them, but they're cruel. You know, I don't. You know, anyway. Right. Verse eight. When you build a ha new house, you shall make a parapet for your roof, that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house, if anyone should fall from it. That naturally should follow being nice to birds, right? But what he's saying is, dude, when you build a house and, and they love to go on their roof in the evenings, right? Just put a little railing around there, okay? You don't want to be guilty for someone going off the top. Um, and I just, what an idea. All of God's laws are intended to be protective spiritual railings, I think, protecting us from getting too close to the edge of spiritual disasters. And now we're going to get into what I might call four laws of separation. Uh, each of these laws was meant to separate Israel from her pagan neighbors who would commonly combine unlike things. This is really strange, really, okay. But, but, but the pagans thought putting odd things together, there was some magical power in that, okay? That's what God's getting at in these laws, okay? Let's just read them. Verse 9, you shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seed, lest the whole yield be forfeited, the crop that you have sown and the yield of the vineyard. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You shall not wear cloth of wool and linen mixed together. You shall make yourself tassels on the four corners of the garment with which you cover yourself. So all four of these rules aren't so much for the sake of the combinations themselves, but so Israel would not imitate the pagan occultic customs of, of their neighbors all around them where they're going. So all I can say is that apparently these things have some sort of meaning. Um, they seem trivial, but like I just said, they can become a slippery slope, can't they? <clears throat> I did read one one commentator tried to sell me on the ox and donkey thing that donkeys have such bad breath they have notoriously bad breath and that over time it could actually cause the ox to die I'm going, please come on no one's died from gingivitis okay or, or, or bad breath whatever but the bottom line is God says don't do where I mean isn't that just dumb anyway uh. it's like you know I don't know don't don't go plow with a great Dane and a dachshund, you know? I mean, just doesn't make any sense, you know? Out. Why would you do that, you know? But then linen and cotton, you know, don't mix things. There was something about that. So uh, nowhere could I find anyone that they came with a, a good practical farming or reason for this, except for this sort of an idea that this was just emblematic of what occult cultures did trying to get some sort of mystical combination of power through the mixture of things that we, you would not normally put together, okay? Um, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness, okay? Now the rest of this chapter is basically a commentary on, <clears throat> on the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Uh, we need to understand in ancient Israel, virginity was highly valued, okay? <clears throat> it was a great loss to give up one's virginity before marriage, and if a woman especially was known to have lost, lost that, it would greatly reduce their chances of getting married. By the same principle, if a husband believed that his wife had lied about that, he would feel extremely cheated. And what follows is an attempt to resolve this sort of issue. <clears throat> Basically, virginity was proved by bleeding the first time she has intercourse. Okay, verse 13, if any man takes a wife, goes into her and then hates her, this word means detests, turns against her, dislikes her, 
um, verse 14, and accuses her of misconduct, sex before marriage, and brings a bad name upon her, saying, I took this woman, and when I came near her, I did not find in her evidence of virginity. And then the father of the young woman and her mother shall take and bring out the evidence of her virginity to the elders of the city gate. This practice is still found in the Middle East and Africa. I still read about this in some of these primitive cultures where missionaries go. It still goes on. Um, it's thought to be unreliable, but um, <clears throat> I hate to say it, but it's thought that it, it, it's largely unreliable unless you're dealing with children under the age of 15. And sadly, that was not uncommon for children, girls 12 and 13, to be given in marriage, okay? So anyway, um, verse 16 goes on. So, the, so the, the husband says, well, I didn't find any proof, blah, blah, blah. It says the mother and the father bring the proof. God must have been a moron because he must have known they had it. But anyway, verse 16, the father of the young woman shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man to marry and he hates her. And behold, he has accused her of misconduct, saying I did not find in your daughter evidence of virginity. And yet this is the evidence of my daughter's virginity. There'd be some sort of a garment or a blanket or something. It would probably be the, the wedding night kind of thing, right? And they spread the cloak before the elders of the city. Okay. Verse 18, and the elders of the city shall take the man and whip him, and they shall <clears throat> fine him a hundred shekels of silver. That's a whole lot of money in that day, several years' salary. It's actually what a bride price might be. And um, so they would, they would fine him and give them to the father of the young one because he had brought a bad name on his daughter, right? And then he goes on, and, he sh and she shall be his wife. He may not divorce her all his days, okay? So this was discouraged, to discourage reckless accusations and character assassination. But look at verse 20. If it's true that evidence of virginity is not found in the young woman, then they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house, and the men of the city shall stone her to death with stones, because she has done an outrageous thing in Israel by whoring in her father's house, so you shall purge the evil from your midst. Now, if this did happen, the fact is that the husband had paid the bride's price, because here's the deal, he had paid a huge sum to marry her, thought to have been, uh, you know, and it could be in cash or flocks or harvests. And yet if the girl was found to have deceived him, it can't be neglected that she possibly knew that to be so and was robbing him of a life of an inheritance, basically, right? You know, it still seems harsh to us today, but that's, that's what it says. Again, we don't know to what extent this or how commonly this was ever done, but certainly, um, it could certainly, this sort of thing being done rampantly, could have under, undermined the whole family culture of Israel, right? Because of, of the way they were wired. Now we go on to flagrant adultery in verse 22. If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall purge evil from Israel. Uh, I, I just found a note, the death penalty was rarely carried out as there were well, there was rarely the required two or three witnesses, okay? Usually just one, okay? And so, um, and, then, and then there was the whole issue. We talked about this last week about if you were the witness, you had to be willing to throw the first stone if you're the one who brought the charge, okay? Um, and so Jesus' encounter with the woman caught, it's interesting, we always notice no man was ever brought forth. So there's something fishy already about the other, there should have been a man brought forth right and no one was willing to be the witness to cast the first stone because there probably wasn't a second or third witness and so uh, there's a lot going on in that little scene right but i think mostly there's a lot of soul searching going on who he was without sin cast the first stone that's really what, what jesus got through to them right um god wanted israel to regard sin much more seriously than we do today didn't he We've done away with this ideal. People don't care much about adultery, and society suffers, I think, a great deal. We now have a couple of rape scenarios. Verse 23, if there's a betrothed virgin, that means all the paperwork's done, the bride price has been paid, just waiting for the marriage ceremony, right? Betrothed man meets her in the city and lies with her. Then you shall bring them both out to the gate of the city, and you shall stone them to death with stones, the young woman, because she did not cry for help. Though she was in the city and the man because he violated his neighbor's wife you shall purge the evil from your midst um well women women knew to scream if, if you're being accosted right villages and towns were small and cramped so this was an expectation um and the motivation uh, to get a scream out was uh, greatly increased by this law verse 25 has another scenario but in the open country a man meets a young woman who's betrothed and the man seizes her lies with her then only the man who lays with her shall die but there would have to be witnesses, wouldn't there? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I mean, I, yeah. verse 26, but you shall do nothing to the young woman. She has committed no offense punishable by death, for in this case is like that of a man attacking and murdering his neighbor because he met her in the open country. And though the betrothed young woman cried for help, there was no one to rescue her, which means there was also no witness. Anyway, interesting kind of a, a law. I think some of these laws were just, hey, just don't ever do this. And number two, I think the purity of Israeli Israelite girls, I just think, was extremely high. I mean, it was extremely high. This is just like an unimaginable scenario, you know. And, and, I, and I don't think rape was common, you know, in Israel. But anyway, here's here's a way that it was to be dealt with. But there are some problems with especially remoteness. <clears throat> I love this, verse 20. If a man meets a virgin who's not betrothed, just a, a girl, seizes her and lies with her and they are found, then the man who lay with her shall give to the father of the young woman 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife because he has violated her. He may not divorce her all his days. I love this. So rather than death, the guy gets sentenced to marriage for life without possibility of divorce. I love it. That's your sentence. <laughs> um... So this is a girl, she's not betrothed, just single gal, whatever. You guys are now, shotgun wedding, right? I think this is the last verse, right? Verse 30, a man shall not take his father's wife so that he does not uncover his father's nakedness. It's probably described the case of a son marrying a stepmother after his polygamous father had died, so probably not his biological mother, but one of his stepmothers. Still considered incest. Uh, even though there was no blood relation because it would basically be a humiliation to his father's name, right? There's just, there's no good spin on that, right? For the father that's died, you know, great, my son, whatever. But significantly recall that this was exactly the same kind of immoral relationship that the Corinthian church was allowing. And Paul specifically addressed it in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2. He says, you, you have a, a, you're allowing a, a man in your church to be married to a stepmother. It's as bold as that. Paul said, what are you, are you nuts? I mean, that goes against everything that we believe, you know? So interesting, that's what that goes on. So interesting couple of chapters. I wish I could, you know, there's sort of like not one great overarching theme for us to walk out with tonight. <laughs> except that God thinks of everything, you know? And, uh, and, I, and we saw some neat things about the Lord and how he thinks. And I just pray we're blessed. But God's a God of justice, honor, a protector of innocence, a protector of women. How many places do we see women being protected? And he, but he's a harsh judge on wickedness. He's a harsh judge on wickedness. But we have his holy word to guide us safely through life. And we take what we can from these into society today. Uh, to try to live a life that makes some sense. It's a blessing. Let me pray.